And so one of the areas for me that has been a, a real fascination is to see the NIH criteria and then to ask all those questions of our database and our experience and see if the data bears out. Let's take the age. As you know, there were three incarnations of the NIH criteria. 1990, it was reconvened in 2002, and then again in 2008. So in 1990, it was decided that age less than 50 would be the appropriate age. If you read that actual article, they openly say there's not obvious data that tells us above 50, age older than 50, there's X percent that someone would develop complications, and less than 50, there's X percent that would. It was, it's spelled out as an arbitrary decision. This seemed prudent, prudent was the way that it was written in there. And therefore, if you, if you know that, that what, you're, uh, what you're dealing with is an arbitrary number, then you kind of say, okay, what about 49-year-olds? What about 48-year-olds? What about 52-year-olds? When you get to 2002, that recommendation has continued. Age less than 50, and then again in 2008, age less than 50. And the rationale was given that if you followed from a cost-effectiveness standpoint, if you followed someone that was in their 40s with the disease, all the testing you would have to do every year wouldn't be cost effective than to just go ahead and have them have surgery. Well, the other end of that is that they didn't know. They didn't know, again, what it would be like for someone to go years and years and years with living with primary hyperparathyroidism. And so that is how the panel came up with the younger age group needed to have surgery. Also the cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness issue, but it, I believe above that was that they simply didn't know. Let's look at our graph of the age of 10,000 patients here, okay? And if you look at this, you'll see here's the age at 50. And if you were to practice in this way, if you're using the criteria that they give you, you say, okay, those that are less than 50, okay, you can go ahead and have your parathyroid tumor removed. Well, that would leave out 82% of patients, all with established primary hyperparathyroidism. If we move on to the next one, criteria of, the criterion of serum calcium. Now, this is another one that as you look at the serum calcium, in 1990, 1 to 1.6 milligrams per deciliter above normal. That's the way it was decided because the number used was 10.4 as a high normal. And so they said 1 milligram, percent of one milligram per deciliter above would be 11.4, 1.6 would be 12. Again, they didn't have data that they could say exactly where things would really get bad for a patient. They just said if you're getting to 12, that just seems too high. And that's really the way that that reads. So when you get to 2002, that was dropped down to one milligram per deciliter above normal. And then in 2008, that was kept at, that, uh, at the one milligram per deciliter above normal. Now let's look at those in much more detail. The average serum calcium level in our 10,000 patients. You've seen the bell-shaped curve that Jim showed you earlier with the normal calcemic patients here, the more extreme hypercalcemia out here number of patients this way and serum calcium on the x-axis. Well, the average serum calcium really isn't the way we practice. I mean, you don't get seven calcium levels on a patient and sit there and calculate their average and say, okay, I think it's 10.4 now, let's head you on over to surgery. We actually practice with the highest serum calcium. So let's look at the peak serum calcium levels. And that is a very, obviously, a very similar graph that Jim showed you earlier. Well, Doug, our lab, the upper limit of normal is 10.2. Okay, so for that group, we have the cutoff of 11.2. So once you got to 11.2, that was okay to go ahead and send someone for surgery. But remember, this is a peak serum calcium level. Every one of these, that's the highest one the patient ever gets. 
So all of those on file, all of these people here, never got to 11.2. So if you look at the next, well, Doug, okay, 11 point, well, what about our, our lab? It's 10.4 at our lab, okay. First you look at this, this left out 77% of people who will never, ever, apparently, get a calcium level above 11.2. So that's 77%. Okay, well, let me look at my lab. It's 11.4, or is our, our high limit of normal is 10.4. Well, one milligram above that is 11.4. If you'd add those in, that's 85% of people who are never going to get that elevated calcium level above 11.4. And when the, NIH, uh, when the NIH criteria came out, the idea was follow these people. If you're not going to operate on them, follow them very religiously because they're going to develop, you need to see that they don't develop this high calcium level above one of these threshold levels because that's when the disease is getting worse. I'm telling you that our data would tell you they're never gonna get that high. They're going to smolder right around here. And that's why these graphs are so high, or, or so bulky right in here. So if we, all right, well mine's 10.6. Okay, well we'll keep going with this. If your lab goes to 10.6, let's include those. That gives you 90.7%. So, so over 90% of patients would never ever get that high calcium level that you're waiting for. If you're waiting by following a calcium level, okay, well it's not there yet, we'll hold off, we'll check it again in a year. Now looking again at something Jim touched on earlier, the 24 hour urine calcium test. Well, the explanations of the NIH uh, panel for this are a Somewhat, enter somewhat entertaining. The, we are all familiar with the 400 milligrams per day. When this is explained, it is explained as this test is very variable. It varies with age, gender, race, the ability to collect it properly. And since those normal ranges can vary so much, the panel says, we chose a number that was well above the highest of all of those different normal ranges. And we picked 400. So there wasn't anything magic about 400 milligrams per day. It just seemed safe, it seemed prudent, before any data could be processed on thousands of patients, that okay, if you're gonna get up to 400 milligrams a day, you're probably more likely to develop a kidney stone, develop renal deterioration, and you ought to go ahead and have the parathyroid tumor removed. So let's look at some of those graphs that Jim was talking about earlier. If you look here, you've got these that Jim will talk more about in a little while, but let's look at this. This is a very familiar looking graph. How many patients don't have a 24 hour urinary calcium above 400? 76%. So three quarters of our patients are never going to have that particular criterion. The scatter plot. Looking at this in even more detail, when you place this, I know it looks a lot like a lot when you first see it, but that's kind of the point of the graph. It's all over the place. People with high, uh, high serum calcium levels here can have very low urinary calcium levels and the exact opposite. And stones, patients with stones and patients without stones can be anywhere on that. And so when you place these data to statistical analysis and you use chi-square goodness of fit testing and p-values and you use all the different statistical methods, you find that there is no correlation, not only between people with stones in their urinary calcium and not stones in their urinary calcium, but also between serum calcium and urinary calcium. So that is another point that this graph is trying to show, is that the 24-hour urinary calcium test is just a test that doesn't give you any meaningful information. This is simply illustrating that this is the, the cutoff. These are all colored purple, and that's the 76% of patients that would not meet the criteria. So, in the latest incarnation of the NIH criteria, they dropped it. In the 2008 issuance of this, it's not meant to use, it's not recommended to be used as a, 
as a decision maker for surgery anymore.